Hey everybody, my name is Matt Yoakum. I am happy to be back here again today with Pro Sound Effects to do another tutorial. This is going to be a follow up to the last tutorial I did about dialogue mixing and sort of the approach to it and what the aims are. Um, if you haven't seen that video yet, pro probably should check that one out first. It's a good primer for this. Um, we had a lot of people ask questions about signal processing. So that's going to be what I'm going to focus on today, mainly just sort of a short walkthrough of how I have my plugins laid out, um, what each one of them does, because understanding each tool and what it does is more important sometimes than the tool itself, because you have to know to, to have a full understanding of what each tool is, is what will allow you to then decide which tools you need at what time, and importantly, in what order. Um, so we'll be going over the signal processing chain for dialogue and the way I approach it. I just want to immediately throw out the caveat that as with most things, especially in creative fields, there's always a thousand ways to go about solving any particular issue. And of course, there will always be people out there who have strong opinions um, about the certain way that they may or may not do something. Um, so, you know, you are welcome to take everything that I give here as uh, with a grain of salt and to understand that maybe there's some other way that somebody may have taught you to go about something and that's totally fine. Um, I'm just gonna go over my workflow and I'll go over some of the reasons as to why I do certain things the way I do. Uh, so without further ado, let's just go ahead and jump on into it and start discussing signal processing for dialogue and film. Okay, so here we are in the Pro Tools session. Um, this is How to Deter a Robber. Uh, this is the same uh, movie that I used for the original dialogue mixing tutorial. That's a great indie film I worked on a year or two ago at this point. Um, uh, Ariel did the dialogue edit for me. And uh, I've just selected this one little clip of audio here. Um, and I've gone back to, I, I've removed all my automation that I had. Um, so we're back to sort of how it sounded originally when, it, when I received it. Uh, and we're just gonna talk about how I would go about it. Honestly, I'm probably just gonna listen to this clip a few times and then start processing and uh, walk, through, walk you through my decisions and the way I've got my chain laid out. So I'm just gonna play the clip as is with no automation going from anything. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Okay, um, so the clip doesn't sound terrible, but there's definitely some noise in there that we wanna clean out, some extra hiss and movement and things that we don't need. Um, again, I will of course emphasize at the beginning we never wanna over sanitize. We never wanna over extract noise. Some of that movement, some of that noise actually helps keep the center channel filled and helps make things feel alive. Uh, when you remove too much of uh, that, you lose some of the warmth. Things tend to feel naked in the middle um, and you lose a lot of the natural occurring uh, movements and, and nuances of uh, the performance even. Uh, when you over sanitize your tracks. So just remember, not all noise is your enemy. Um, just the stuff that's distracting. In this case, uh, it's a little too heavy. It is a little distracting. So I'm going to take a listen to this clip uh, one more time and decide on what we should atta uh, attack first. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or... Uh... We can go back and talk to my angry mom. Okay. So this first little clip here is definitely uh, the most egregious. You'll notice uh, there was um, some light RXing done in this, just declicking and stuff from Ariel for me, just getting rid of the, the really obvious easy stuff. Um, uh, but I can always copy down so I can make sure I can unwind. I'm going to first start with Isotope. Dialogue Isolate, pull this open here. Um, I do like to first approach a noise reduction oftentimes at the clip level with audio suites, if, especially for something like this sort of denoising. I don't wanna really run 
um, denoising, like active denoising on uh, my insert tracks. They tend to be very CPU heavy. They introduce a lot of latency. Um, and it's just not necessarily the most uh, efficient way to work a lot of time. You know, it's all based on the context of each clip. And sometimes that literally means going sentence by sentence, clip by clip to process in the best way. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead, uh, I'm gonna do just a little bit of light noise reduction. So I'm gonna start just by like scraping off five dB of the noise floor here. Um, again, I, I also wanna emphasize from the very beginning, you know, there's so many tools out there. Um, everybody has a slightly different way of working. You know, I may say one thing that one person uh, you know, completely dis disagrees with and they work a whole different way and, you know, somebody else might suggest something that I might not recommend and that's okay. Honestly, just as long as it sounds good, it is good. At the end of the day, if your client's happy, if it's sounding good, don't sweat too much the individual plugins and, you know, who used what and whatever. Um, but of course, I will go through and describe the logic behind the decisions that I'm making here. Um, and then you can obviously, you know, make the best with the tools that you have at your disposal. There's so many, um, you know, different kinds of uh, denoising software out there ranging in price range from, you know, less than $100 to thousands of dollars. So don't sweat it too much. Use what tools you have available uh, at your disposal and it'll be all good. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start off by scraping off 5dB with dialog isolate here from Isotope. Let's see what this sounds like. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Okay, so that worked uh, reasonably well. Got it just a little of a, uh, it got rid of a little bit of a smidge of the, the noise in here in the beginning. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Um, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to do some clip gain here. I'm just going to pull down. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Just some of these peaks. You can see them visually. You can also hear them. They, they pump a little bit. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Okay, I think I overdid that last one, but uh, that's much smoother now. We have two options, okay? Either we can stay here. Oops. Push this guy up just a little bit. Pull this down a dB or two. Let's just try one. We have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or... Give it a little bit of more on ghosts. We can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or... Uh... We can go back and... Talk to some ghosts or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Okay, so I didn't want to bring up that uh, rustle there. This is one of the great things about working with clip gain to start when you're leveling out your lines um, is it's, it's a very visual process, which is super helpful actually. You can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Okay. So let's listen to this one more time. Now I did the leveling. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Jimmy. All right, that's feeling better. Um, I do wonder if it's worth trying the very slightest amount of D Russell. Um, this plugin tends to uh, over noise reduce very quickly. So I'm going to um, take the reduction strength down to 1.5, which is a, supposedly going to be a very soft touch. Leave ambience preservation at 100 because I'm just concerned with the rustle, not the background noise right now. Um, and these are sort of different uh, levels. 
of um, intensity with which the the algorithm will run from uh, Isotope. It's like, you know, how much CPU do, CPU do you want to run? Um, I, I'm going to just put this at advanced, which is like, you know, the, the highest level quality. Um, and I'm really probably... I'll try processing the whole thing and see if it doesn't do too much. But I'm always going to copy down and then render. All right. Let's see how that sounds. Let's, we can look at it visually. I like toggling back and forth to see what changed. I mean, you can see some of this in here is taken care of. Some of this stuff is gone. Let's just hear how it sounds. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. That actually sounds like it did a pretty good job. So the, so the good news is I do have um, my effects and music stems, you know, that I have the, uh, you know, the help of the fact that they've already been mixed um, underneath as guide tracks, but I can play this against, you know, the guides and hear that, uh, you know, the dialogue needs to come up a little bit to compete with the background and the, and the music. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or... Uh... We can go back and talk to my angry mom. Ugh. Okay, so that's sounding pretty decent now that we've done the audio sweet noise reduction. Um, now let's get into the fun part that a lot of you were asking about, which are the plugins and the, the processing chain. Um, same as I've mentioned before, I believe I mentioned it in the dialogue uh, tutorial, I want to have parity between all of my tracks in terms of what plugins I'm using. So if you'll notice here, on every one of my dialogue tracks, I have, except for the FUTs tracks uh, down here, um, which obviously are going to be different because I'm uh, futzing with them, um, all of these regular dialogue tracks are going to have the exact same order of plugin because I want to be able to, at any point, decide that I want to separate a clip, move it up to a different track for some reason, and have all of the automation retain. If your plugins are in a different order on a different track and you move a clip, to a track where it's different order, uh, Pro Tools will not recognize, uh, you know, the difference. It'll just see that parameters aren't lining up and it'll clear that automation. Uh, so we definitely do not want to do that. Um, we always want to make sure we have parity so that our automation tracks um, and uh, hopefully, you know, if you're just doing dialogue editing, you'll probably be working maybe with an EQ at the head or maybe even uh, no inserts at all. But once you're in the mixing stage, you're absolutely going to want to make sure th these are consistent. So pay attention to that. Um, so starting here first, uh, this plugin is called WNS. It's made by Waves. Um, this uh, plugin in particular is going to be doing a type of noise su suppression that works in bands. There are many different uh, options for this exact sort of noise suppressor actually made by several different companies. Uh, one of them is Waves. This is the WNS unit. Um, uh, there's also one that's made by uh, Mick DSP. I forget the exact model number on that one. Um, and then, of course, uh, these units are sort of modeled both visually and sonically off of the original uh, Cedar products. Um, the Cedar products uh, have this exact same sort of layout. Uh, they cost thousands of dollars. So if you're lucky enough to be working with that software, that's great. Uh, if you don't, uh, Waves WNS passes just fine, um, and this thing does fairly often go on sale, I think, so uh, be sure to look out for that. If the, This is definitely a plugin you want to pick up if you're doing dialogue work, dialogue mixing work. Um, so the way this works is essentially it's, it is a combination between a couple of different processes. It almost... It sort of works like EQ. I, do, I'm not, I don't want to say it's the same as EQ because it isn't, but you can think of it that way. Um, each of these faders is assigned to a frequency band. Um, it's a little faint and hard to see here, but uh, this one starts at 30. This is 99. This is 330. This is 1,094, so 1K. This is uh, 3.6K, and this is 12K. Um, and what you can do on here is you can slide uh, these values left or right to increase or decrease the value of the starting point. So 
Um, usually I just leave this at default, but let's say I set this at, let's say 60 hertz, because anything below that is just going to be mud and rumble, and we don't want that to be part of our signal anyways. So this is now uh, 170, 500, 1.4K, 4K, and 12K. So those are some, that's like a good frequency range to work in. Um, I am currently in read mode. What I'm going to do is I'm going to flip over to touch latch, and then uh, I'm gonna flip into preview mode here. Um, what preview mode will do is it won't write any automation, but it will, it, it kind of puts your Pro Tools in a temporary read mode. Um, so what I can do is like if I hit start. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either. I can pull down this band and now anywhere I click, it's gonna retain that automation as like a temporary state. If I exit preview, it'll put it back. Um, but I'm gonna work in preview mode here. I'm just gonna take a listen to this. And I'm gonna start pulling down each of these bands um, just so you can hear what's happening. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Jimmy. Okay, so what this is doing is on each of these bands, as I pull down this fader, it's going to minimize the amount of noise that I hear within this band. It's doing this process, uh, like, like the way this is working sort of behind the scenes in the plugin, is it's doing uh, what's known as expansion. And so, the, the, the basic explanation of what that means is that when I pull this fader down, uh, it is going to reduce uh, the volume of the frequencies that fall within this band. But when enough signal hits that band, it will temporarily lift the compression or the volume difference to allow the signal to come back through but what that does is it hides the noise in between. So like, it's like, you can think of it as the opposite of compression, actually. Expansion is the opposite of compression. Some people will refer to it as upwards compression. Um, and what that is, is like, you know, on a standard compressor, you set a threshold, and when signal passes that threshold, you set a ratio to determine how much the gain gets reduced once you've crossed that threshold, right? So if I set signal at minus 20 and the incoming, or sorry, the threshold at minus 20 and the incoming signal exceeds minus 20, the ratio will then determine how much gain reduction gets applied to keep down the peak above minus 20. So expansion works exactly the opposite way. And I'll actually show you um, in Pro-Q3, how it works might give a better visual. Um, but for now, I, what I've done is I've listened and I've sort of gauged that a lot of the noise is happening in the higher end of the spectrum. Um, and so I'm pulling some of the higher frequencies down. Um, and I'm going to write this across this selection, this automation. And then what I would normally do is move on to the next plugin in the chain, which will be EQ. The reason I do WNS first is because I want to, aside from the audio suite processing that I do on this clip to remove noise, I want noise reduction to be the first thing that happens uh, in my chain. And the reason for that uh, are a, a few things. Number one, um, I, I want to remove noise at the head so that I'm processing what the signal sounds like after the noise has been taken out because there may be things like tones or hums or hiss or things that I wanna to try to remove with noise reduction first, as opposed to spending a bunch of time trying to fix those things with EQ, getting really surgical. If something like WNS is able to scrub that away much more efficiently, um, I wanna work and sort of manipulate the tone and the frequency of things after it's been uh, run through noise reduction. The second reason, um, uh, and we, I'll talk about this a little bit later, is I always want to set my compressor at the very end of the chain. At least this is the way I work. And the, the logic behind that is, again, I want the noise to be reduced first because when I compress the signal later, the idea is that I'm going to reduce loud sounds with compression so I can then 
push back up the overall gain, and if I'm reducing loud to boost quiet, if the noise isn't already taken out of the signal, I'm gonna be boosting the noise before I do any noise reduction. And to me, that is super counterproductive. So the I'll, I'll explain that a little bit better in detail and show you guys what I'm talking about once we get to it. But just for now, believe me, I want the compressor at the end of my chain and I want noise reduction to happen first. Um, so next, I will jump into EQ. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Okay, so the spectrum looks fairly balanced here. I, I'm, to my ears and my speakers in my home studio, it's sounding a little warm, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, um, but I'm just gonna go after the tones that I hear here and uh, see how our EQ shape ends up. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Okay, I think I like that EQ shape. Um, I've taken out some of these sort of like mid-range honky kind of sounding uh, frequencies here in the middle. I've done a pretty significant scoop there. Gone over, gone after a couple of things I was hearing in the high mid-range um, uh, that were poking out to me, and I'm giving just a tiny bit of brightness back uh, at the top end of the spectrum that was removed back when we did some of the noise reduction. Um, and it's okay to bring something back after the fact if, if, you, if it sounds good to your ears. Um, I know a lot of mixers tend not to add back in high frequencies. Of course, it's always content dependent and context dependent. You have to use your ears, um, but I'm happy with the shape of this EQ on its own. And again, this is without hearing against the uh, music and effects guides. So we'll take a listen to that now. Um, I do like to sort of shape the tone in a vacuum first and then put it up against the mix, but do be sure that when you're going through any processing that you're always uh, returning to reference against the other material if it's at your disposal. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Okay, this sound, sounding fine. Uh, I'll probably give another DB back. Uh, some of this noise reduction uh, by its, you know, the nature of what we're doing here. Um, we don't need anything below 60, so I might as well take some out. Some of the noise reduction that we're doing here will inherently bring down the volume, especially if we're bringing things down a little bit across the board. Um, I do really quick, I know we just found this EQ shape. I wanna just quickly explain uh, the concept of the expansion a little better. Um, so I'm gonna flip into uh, just the B mode here, the you know other EQ curve I have available. Um, you won't be hearing the original EQ curve I did and that's okay. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is just demonstrate something. Uh, I'm actually going to temporarily bypass WNS so we can hear the original file, the clip that we have here, even though we've already done some noise reduction. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? So what WNS is doing is it's essentially like pulling down, I can actually uh, open it up over here too so we can see both plugins at the same time. When I pull down you know, this 12K fader, let's just pretend it's, it's closer and I've got this at 6K, but it's fine just to visually show what's going on here. Um, if I pull down this fader, it's like pulling down this EQ, but what Pro-Q has built in here is this dynamic uh, section and what norm what we normally do is this works just like compression it essentially is this is multi-band compression is you pull down this range here and when audio peaks up 
Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some good. Right, so as the threshold is met, this is set to an auto threshold. You can actually pop open this little arrow here um, and manually set this threshold. But you know, for most cases, auto threshold works fine. As the threshold is met, it will begin to noise, it will begin to compress this frequency as frequency hits it. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some guys. Okay, and you can see that band working there. It's compressing down as signal is hitting it. Expansion is just exactly the opposite. We can literally grab this curve and go the other way. Now what's happening is when I pull down this fader, like, like one of these here in the middle, for example, if I take this curve and pull it downwards, what it's gonna do is it's gonna overall reduce the volume by like right now it's an extreme amount. So like, you know, nine, let's just say 10 dB, right? But then what I can do is expand back up to unity. And so what happens is as signal hits the threshold, it will actually push it back upwards. And so what it's doing is temporarily flexing back up to allow that frequency band to pass, but then flexing back down to a reduced amount uh, as the threshold goes back to zero, because what you wanna do is set your threshold above the noise floor so that the noise floor itself isn't triggering it to hit back up. And we can actually visually do this too. If I pop this back out, Let's take, um, let's make this just a really big, broad, sweeping EQ thing so it's super apparent. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either. So you can, here. so you can see when she's not talking that the threshold is down here. It's pretty low. We don't need to go that low at the threshold, but anything up in here is going to be far enough away that the noise floor is not going to trigger it to let go. So if I bring this expansion way down, we're not gonna hear it expanding, you'll just hear the EQ dip. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh... Okay, you can hear how much I muffled with the EQ. Now if I expand back upwards to Unity, what it should do is as she talks, it will flex back upwards, allowing those frequencies through, and that is exactly what WNS is doing. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Okay, so obviously this is an extreme example here. I'm going to exit preview mode. It's gonna put everything back the way I had it because I didn't commit anything. Um, but yeah, so that is a visual representation of what is happening inside of WNS. And so you can replicate it. And of course you may say, okay, well, why didn't you just do this in Pro-Q3? Um, it's fast and easy in WNS and it sounds good. Uh, so I, I, I like the quality of WNS as uh, audio passes through it. So we've set our IQ, we've done some noise, some noise reduction here. Um, I'm gonna open up, I love this plugin. I cannot say enough good things about this plugin. Sooth2 is one of my favorites. Um, what this is doing, this is, this is one of the, the few plugins I have in my chain that is like an auto betterizer, right? Like it just makes things better. Um, and it's gonna do a lot of automatic processing and that's fine with me because it sounds great even when you push it hard. What this is gonna do um, is you have these different bands in here uh, and you have like an overall mix depth. There's a ton of other parameters here, but you know, mainly what I'm focused at are looking at this spectrum and then looking at this sort of, it's almost like a mix knob, if you will. I'm gonna go back into preview mode. Um, what it's gonna do is it's gonna look for resonances. It uses, it's using machine learning and these different algorithms to figure out what these resonances are, things that are sticking out in the signal that shouldn't be there. And it's going to reduce them automatically and very surgically and quickly for me. Um, so I'll show you, like right now it's at minus three, so it's doing barely anything, if anything at all. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and play with it. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either. We can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Okay, so there's still a little bit of resonance I can hear in her voice. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna turn this uh, up as we play through. 
uh, and you'll see those peaks start to get more and more intense as I push up the mix. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Okay, so this is pushed all the way and it doesn't sound great. It can especially make S's uh, disappear. But I'm going to, I usually like to keep this in the three to five range, depending. Her voice isn't super resonant, but I mean, it sounds good with it reduced. So I'm just gonna hear what this sounds like set at five. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. Um, so at three, you know, four around here, it sounded really good. Um, you can see it catching some of the two and a half K resonances that I was hearing. It'll even do a little bit further down. I was seeing some, and then some of the S's, it works as a DS or two. It's an all in one, very smart, very lightweight, just great sounding plugin. Uh, this would probably be one of my desert Island plugins. If I were a, just a dialogue mixer, um, and was only allowed to pick a few things. Um, so now we move on to FabFilters Pro DS. There's not a great example of uh, DSing being needed here, but I do love this plugin. Um, of course, um, again, there are a million DS plugins out there. Um, ones that are built into Pro Tools, ones made by tons of different companies. Um, I tend to love everything that FabFilter makes, so I use their DSer. Um, I really like that it show, it'll light up this frequency spectrum here, so you can sort of zone in on problem areas and you can expand and contract the range of frequency that you're affecting um, and that is triggering the threshold. Um, again, you can set your threshold here. The range is how much noise reduction is going to get done, and it'll do a noise reduction meter over here. Um, so, you know, I will put these, I'm going to exit preview to put this back to how it was, and then I'm going to hit play, and we're just going to watch and see. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and... Talk to my angry mom. Okay, again, so like really not any DSing needed here, um, but if there were, it would show up right here and you could even see in the little waveform graph there, it, it'll pick up and show you visually where it finds the, the, the resonances and the higher frequencies um, and point those out to you. And lastly, uh, is gonna be talking about compression. Compression, again, I'm using FabFilter, just feel free to use any compressor available to you. You're going to want a compressor that it, at minimum offers you a threshold, a ratio, um, some sort of makeup gain function, and attack and release, um, you know, almost nearly every compressor has, uh, but, um, you know, they're helpful to have too. I, I usually just set and forget these settings, to be honest. I'm mostly focused on the threshold and the ratio and the makeup gain. Um, I do tend to leave Pro C2 on auto uh, makeup gain. So in other words, like as it's doing noise reduction, it's gonna be automatically doing some boosting to the output. Um, it tends to sound fine. Uh, it doesn't sound fine in all cases, especially the heavier and the compression you go and the more it tries to pump. Uh, upwards to compensate for what you're uh, reducing. Um, you know, things can get funky and, and sound like you're affecting. That is one of the goals, obviously, here with the dialogue mixing and the signal chain processing is that you don't typically want the voice to sound affected, um, especially when we're just doing cleanup. Obviously, if you're going for some kind of a perspective or if you're going for uh, some kind of like a, a um, you know, a design approach to the dialogue, then, you know, all, all bets are off and, you know, do whatever you need to do to make it sound good. Um, but when we're just talking about regular dialogue cleanup and processing, um, I almost always want to uh, make sure that it sounds clean and unaffected as if it were naturally recorded perfectly in the first place. Um, Again, this she's not yelling. There's not a lot of uh, variance here. I did, you know, when I go through and do that clip gain automation that I did, that is like almost a manual version of compressing. Because what the compressor does is, again, I'm gonna set my threshold, I'm gonna set my ratio, and I'm just gonna try to remove some of the peaks on things, especially if there's a lot of dynamic range and she goes from quiet to screaming or whatever, vice versa. Um, 
in this case, it's okay, but let's just take a look at it anyways. Jimmy, we have two options, okay? Either we can stay here, talk to some ghosts, or uh, we can go back and talk to my angry mom. All right, so she gives a very even performance here. We already evened it out with the clip gain. Uh, so it's a fairly, you know, uh, just barely kissing the, the compressor here. It's a fairly mundane uh, compression setting we're setting here, and that's fine. Um, again, like, you know, everything is always within context. It's always content dependent. I know that's, it's kind of a throwaway answer. And I know some people will say, you know, well, what about this or what about that? And unfortunately the answer is always, it depends. Um, but that is why it's so important to understand how these tools work and the way we set them up and, and, you know, why we set them up in the order that we do or why we do certain processing before others, um, and understanding and having, uh, even just, a uh, uh, a rudimentary understanding of how each of these works will help you decide what you need for each situation. So, you know, that was just the basic go through of my um, sort of uh, chain here. Find what works best for you with the tools that you're able to use and afford or whatever may even be available at the stage that you're on. Um, you know, the goal obviously is to just have the dialogue be clean and transparent. And if you're if you're a person who's like super caught up and worried about the plugins, just remember like people were making dialogue sound good, you know, well before any of these tools were available. Um, and that's okay. I hope that's helpful. I hope that gives you some insight into the process here and the thought process and, and gets you familiar with how some of these things work conceptually, even if they're not the same plugins, the ideas cross over to all the other options that are available. Uh, so yeah, thanks again. Uh, please uh, like and subscribe. Uh, leave us comments on what you thought and uh, what sort of subjects you'd like to see future tutorials on. And we'll see you guys around next time.